Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us on this lovely Thursday afternoon. I see the sun is shining. It looks like a nice day, probably still a little chilly. So are you trying to grow more natives in your garden? Are you not too sure where to begin? Or you think it might be a little bit more difficult than, um, than you're ready for? Well, our next two guests are going to showcase not only easy to grow native plants and shrubs, but they're also gonna highlight the pollinators that depend on these plants. Basically the reason why we should be planting native plants. So please join me in welcoming Donna Lang and Andrea Rowe. For the past 12 years, Donna has been a coordinator for Greening Sacred Spaces and Faith in the Common Good in Toronto. And she has helped over 400 faith communities do energy efficient retrofits and plant faith community edible and pollinator gardens. To date, she has helped create 16 gardens. She is passionate, uh, passionate about the relationship between native plants and pollinators. And for the past four years, she was director of the North American Native Plant Society. Andrea Rowe, uh, some of you might have already recognized already, she is their director of sustainable environments here at HEN with us. So I'm going to let these two, there's a lot more to say about Andrea, of course, but uh, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Andrea as she is an employee at HEN. So I'm going to let them take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. So I'm Donna Lang and I wanna welcome everyone. Uh, here's the agenda before you for the webinar today. Our topic of course is creation care, gardening for the birds and the bees. And I'm going to begin by reading the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that our projects from coast to coast are on traditional territories of diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We seek to live in respect, peace and right relations. And we are mindful of broken covenants. By making a land acknowledgement, we're taking part in an act of reconciliation, honoring the land and indigenous heritage, which dates back over 10,000 years. And that is the um, acknowledgement for Turtle Island all across Canada, just in case we have visitors from across the country. So I'm going to start off by talking to you about the importance of native plants. I'm going to talk briefly about invasive species. And then Andrea is going to do a case study of a faith community in Oakville. And she's going to explain why it's important to remove invasive species. And then lastly, I'm going to take you through uh, 15 native plants and highlight which birds and pollinators they attract. And the hope is that you will be able to incorporate some of these into your own native plant garden. So why pollinator or why native plant gardens? Well, there are several benefits. One, they provide habitat for birds, insects, butterflies, and bees, so for pollinators. Two, they provide food, both nectar and pollen for pollinators. And you probably already know the statistics, but pollinators are responsible for 85% of fruits and vegetables that we eat. So we need them. They're also larval hosts for specific caterpillars. And I'm gonna take you into some information about that later. And also, we know that birds are a declining population. And so caterpillars are very important because birds need them for food. Douglas Tallamy's research says that 5% of native plants account for 75% of food that caterpillars eat. So what that's saying is that native plants are used by certain caterpillars and the caterpillars are selecting those native plants to go to. And I think that's an incredible statistics when you think that 5% of native plants account for 75% of the food the caterpillars eat. So some more benefits. Well, they draw down carbon, we know that. They conserve water. Native plants have been here before the settlers arrived. And when you plant them the first year, you do need to water them, but year two less so. And by year 
three and onwards, you don't really need to water them at all. You can just let, let mother nature take, take care of them. Uh, they also provide health benefits because they emit oxygen. And if you're doing a community garden, and I do about five community gardens in Toronto every year with faith communities, and I know you also do them in Halton, um, you need to remember that it's not just about planting a garden. There's a social uh, interaction and cohesion and bonding that takes place uh, with community gardens. And lastly, they assist in long-term management of invasive species. The, uh, the last two slides, by the way, the photographs are from the Credit Valley Conservation Authority. I got them from their website when I, I wrote a, a book on native plants uh, three or four years ago, and they're absolutely beautiful. So uh, their website is very rich, and I encourage you to go there. So a little bit about invasive species. Well, they don't contribute to a healthy ecosystem, and that's uh, with the exception of Queen Anne's lace and dandelions. Um, and they outcompete native species um, by creating a monoculture. In other words, they just take over, they're very aggressive. They will also impact diversity for competing for light and moisture and soil nutrients, which really means that seedlings and agricultural crops are diminished. And lastly, they affect wildlife that has adapted to native plant areas. Oh, I should tell you that photograph that you just saw. So uh, that was a cardinal flower in, in between the, uh, the two patches, the Oreo cookie, if you like, center was the uh, cardinal flower for my garden up north. I think that they're just beautiful flowers. So these are the top 10 offenders in terms of invasive species. Periwinkle, English ivy, autumn olive, Norway maple, garlic mustard, hogweed, dog strangling vine, Japanese knotweed, buckthorn, and lastly, phragmites. And this list came from the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, which also has a, just an excellent website. And a little bit about the dreaded Phragmites. Phragmites love wet conditions. You'll find them in roadside ditches and along the edges of ponds and lakes. Cottage country these days is really feeling the impact of Phragmites as it's affected the shorelines and things like swimming and um, boating and fishing. And I have friends that had a pond up north and we got the Nottawasaga Conservation uh, Authority to come in and have a look at their pond because it was full of Phragmites. Uh, and unfortunately they left it too long and the Conservation Authority said they couldn't do anything about it. It was too far gone. So you wanna get Phragmites uh, in the beginning stage if you can. And as we all know, once you change the habitat of an area, the wildlife that depends on it is deeply affected. So this translates into birds and bees and butterflies and insects, mammals and aquatic life that won't have enough food or shelter in order to survive. So now I'm going to hand this over to Andrea. I was going to do a, a case study, a very interesting case study on Phragmites. Andrea. Thank you, Donna. Um, and for those of you who um, uh, aren't as familiar with me, I am the direct, uh, Director of Sustainable Environments at Home Environmental Network. And I also represent the local chapter of Faith in the Common Good in our Greening Sacred Spaces program. So that's how Donna and I got to know each other. Uh, so thank you, Donna, for uh, joining us today. It's always nice to have another voice um, adding to the conversation. Um, and as Donna mentioned, I'm going to uh, give you a bit of an overview of a project that we're working on here in Oakville. And um, it is specifically dealing with this patch of uh, ground on the east side of the property. Uh, the site is the Meeting House, a local church. And there's a bioswale in the, uh, on the 
commercial property that is supposed to drain the water from the parking lot um, down into a storm drain into uh, one of the sewage or sewer catchment systems. Um, and it's completely invaded uh, with Phragmites. So it's um, in the middle of this industrial area. There's a lot of impermeable pavement. And uh, now we've decreased even more um, the ability of the water to drain. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, hopefully that um, solves the problem on uh, if anybody else is hearing an echo on my computer. Yeah. Is it better now? No, you're still getting it? Okay. Still well, getting I, I apologize. How bad is it? Should I try and solve my technical difficulties? I would try to if you can, but if you can't, then. All right. Well, we'll see what I can do. I can see if I can mute this computer. If I use the other computer, is that still? That's better. That better? Um, I think you I think it's workable. Yeah. Oh, and now I can't hear you. <laughs> I was just saying it's better. What do you think, Helen? Yeah, that's slightly better. Go go for it. <laughs> now you're on mute though. All right, there's no TV on in the background for whoever asked that, but um, I do have an older laptop and the fan is going, so <laughs> could be part of the problem. So time to upgrade the technology. Um, okay, so the meeting house uh, on the east side of Oakville, in the 403 Dundas area for anybody who is uh, familiar with it. The storm drain, um, we've had a, a consultant come in and uh, Credit Valley Conservation has also done some conservation um, or some uh, consultation rather on this site. And uh, it's approximately 10 years worth of growth of Phragmite. So if we had caught it and start to dealt with it uh, a few years ago, it would have been easier. But right now we've got a, about an 80 meter by 20 meter stand of Phragmites that the church is trying to get under control and renaturalize and turn into a, a more productive part of the landscape. So Don, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll just give an overview of what it looks like. There we go. So it's rather awful looking. And um, so here's from the street view, you can see that that's the storm drain where all of the water is supposed to flow. And you can barely see it down in that inset picture, but it's completely overgrown. So what the church is hoping to do um, this coming year is to remove the Phragmites and um, renaturalize the area with native species, if you can go to the next slide, please. We'll start to show some of the reasons why. Oh, we've got some formatting issues here too. Not a good day for technology. Um, so in uh, the Credit Valley Conservation, because this is part of the Credit Valley watershed, even though we're located physically in Holton region, um, the watershed crosses boundaries. Georgetown and Acton have a lot of uh, Credit Valley watershed as well as does this Eastern part of Oakville. So when Credit Valley came out to do some consultation on the property, they noticed that um, the church area is within some pretty significant natural areas and that nearby, um, even within 400 meters, is a very large wood lot and a number of um, birds of noted Concern. Some of them are species at risk. Have been seen within the air, uh, within the area. So the church feels it's very important to extend this habitat to provide more natural areas for ground nesting birds, and um, to just restore the property in accordance with uh, their faith beliefs and what the creation care team has specifically uh, dedicated themselves to doing. So this is a newly formed group within the church that wants to focus on removing the invasives and replanting with native species. Next slide. So here are some of the birds that have been recorded in those nearby uh, woodlot areas. So uh, naturalists such as the Halton Kill Birders Association, 
These are important groups that go out on their own time, uh, looking for wildlife to either photograph or to document. And um, these are some of them that have been noted. So if you just go one more slide forward, please. There we go. So a wood thrush, um, which is a species of special concern has been seen nearby. So when we replant the area, we wanna make special note of what does this particular bird need as far as habitat and food sources. And the next slide, please. And the Eastern Meadowlark. So just to give two quick examples, this is a species at risk. So again, what can we do to protect this particular species of bird? And what can we do um, to give it what it needs um, to have a, a more sustainable habitat? Okay, thank you. That was really interesting. A super project. I'm interested to, um, to hear more about it. So these next few slides will show you 15 easy to grow native plants. And these are the native plants that Andrea and her team have selected to grow in the native plant garden at Meeting House. Um, Meeting House is in Oakville, as most of you know. So before you begin a design of a garden, before you, you begin to plant a garden, you need to ask yourself some questions. So you need to look at your area and you need to say, hmm, okay, how much sun, how many hours a day, how much shade does this area get? You need to ask what type of soil you have. Is it dry? Is it mesic, which is considered normal, or is it wet? Um, when do you want your, your flowers to appear? When do you want the, the bloom to happen? Do you want uh, spring, summer, fall, or do you want a real blast in spring and have everything um, come out in, that month, in those months? So um, the last one to look at as well is the color palette. What colors do you like? What colors do you think would look good in the area that you're planting? And then the question that I always love to do some research on is which pollinator, pollinators like which plants? So I tend to choose the native plants I plant in my garden. Um, if I want to attract bees, I look for ones that attract bees. If I want to attract caterpillars, I look for ones that attract um, caterpillars. And of course, um, there are some that are host specific, so uh, they will only go to that particular plant. So you can also make sure you get that pollinator by planting whatever their host plant is. I should mention as well, I'm going to show you a book at the end when we go through a few resources uh, by Lorraine Johnson. It's called Easy to Grow, 100 Easy to Grow Native Plants. And that's been my go-to guide in terms of trying to find out what plants that I, I should plant. So uh, the first of 15 plants here is Little Blue Stem. It's the host larval plant for skipper butterflies. And that means that that uh, skipper butterfly wants to go to blue stem and it's chosen that plant as its go-to. Birds also love eating the seeds. And you'll see how it's a blue green in the spring summer and then it becomes uh, a, a brownish color in the fall. And in the fall, uh, the birds love eating the, the seeds. And you can see them there at the end of the branch. Okay, the next one is the elderberry. So the elderberry, you're probably familiar with, uh, they're eaten by birds and mammals, and deers love the twigs and also the leaves. They bloom in spring and they have a white flower, and I didn't show a photograph of the white flower because I wanted to show you where the berries appear on, on the actual um, elderberry. They're edible, and most of you have probably tasted uh, pies or preserves or maybe even elderberry wine. And they can grow up to 12 feet, so you have to take that into consideration as well. The willow, the mighty willow. Well, I just learned about willows 
when I watched um, a webinar this fall and how important they are. They are third in terms of trees only to oaks and the prunus genus, which is the cherries, plums, apricots, and peach, um, for the number of caterpillars that they attract. So this is now looking at a universe of trees only when we talk about this, but the third, uh, as I say, to oaks and the prunus genus. So they're very important. Um, they're catkins or they're pussy willows, which you see at the top of the screen, eat the pollen of the dogwood. Sorry, of the pussy willow. Um, pussy willows have cat, catkins, dogwoods do not. And um, they're larval hosts to morning cloak, eastern swallowtail, and viceroy butterflies. And also several moths and native bees. And birds love them because birds love eating the pollinators that are attracted to their flowers. And they also love to eat the caterpillars that are eating their leaves. So they're a great source of food to pollinators. And they're also uh, very important in terms of uh, being a species that provides for a lot of caterpillars. They provide for about 230 different species of caterpillars. So now we have the dogwood and isn't it beautiful? It's one of the most popular native plant trees and it has a very showy white flower in the spring. In uh, the fall, its leaves turn red. Uh, butterflies and native bees eat the pollen of the dogwood and lots of bird species and deer love to eat the red berries in the fall. The dogwood is a larval host to the spring azure butterfly. And in the past, Native Americans used the bark to cure uh, malaria, and they also used the roots um, for a red dye. And it's important to look at the height here because they can grow up to 36 feet. Although there are lots of dogwoods that are much smaller than that. And you can ask for the, the dwarf version, if you like. You can notice here that these photographs, a lot of them have come from the Lady Bird Johnson database. I really recommend if you want to learn more about plants as well, this is a great resource for you. So this is Indian grass. The flowering parts have a metallic yellow sheen. You'll see it's a golden yellow in the spring. And then in the fall, they go to a rich gold and purple color. Don't know if you can really see the purple there, maybe down here. Um, in the fall, uh, they produce seeds, as you can see. They're the larval host to the pepper and salt um, skipper and also the little wood satyr butterfly. The seeds are eaten by birds and mammals alike, and they can grow up to eight feet. So if you're looking at how you want to sculpt your garden, you also want to look at height to make sure that the tall ones are in the back, shorter ones are in the front. So the blue flag iris, it's a wetland plant, so it likes wet feet that blooms in late spring. Its flower is a bluish purple color and birds such as hummingbirds love to eat its nectar. Um, this is a ruby red throat hummingbird and we have quite a few of those uh, in our garden. And this, I believe, is a female because it's green, as you see right here, and there's no red stripe around the neck, which is what the male has. So the monkey flower. I've never seen the monkey flower before doing this presentation, but I think it's really something I'd like to, to grow. Um, 
it's thought to have a face like a monkey, thus the name. Butterflies, bees, and moths eat the nectar. They bloom in springtime, and they also like to have wet feet. And their color varies from a reddish purple, which is this color, I think, to a pinkish blue. So I think they're fun. And I saw other photographs uh, of them where it actually did look like a monkey's face. Um, but I thought this one was fun because it had a pollinator on it. Meadow sweet. The meadow sweet also likes to have wet feet. Uh, it's medicinal. Its flower head contains salicylic acid. And salicylic acid is used uh, for ailments such as colds, upset stomachs, and bronchitis. Bees, wasps, butterflies, and beetles are attracted to its flowers, nectar, and pollen. And the last, the next, if you like, the last of the, the four plants that like wet feet is sneezeweed. Sneezeweed got its name because it used to be used to make snuff in the old days. And uh, so I thought that was kind of fun, thus the name sneezeweed. And its dried leaves were what was used to make the snuff. Sneezeweed's flowers, stems, and leaves are all poisonous to humans, but the butterflies love them. And this is Joe Pye weed. So Joe Pye weed will be either a pinkish color or a purplish color. And it's a very hardy plant. It grows in any type of condition. It's quite tall and can grow up to six feet. It attracts several types of butterflies, such as the skipper butterfly and also the monarch, which you see here on the flower. And all sorts of bees, so bumblebees and green metallic sweat bees, all sorts of insects and birds. And um, I once read 10 years ago in Canadian Living Gardening Magazine that Joe Pieweed was the plant of the year. So I decided I was going to go and buy some. So I went to the local nursery, filled my cart with 12 of them, and I, thought just before I got to the cash register, I better check to see if I have any Joe Pye in my garden. Uh, and sure enough, uh, I, I went and looked and I had many Joe Pye in my garden. So this is just to tell you that make sure you go and have a look at what you've got before you go and get excited about some new variety that you already have. So this next one is my favorite. So this is butterfly milkweed. It has so many visitors, butterflies, bees, and insects. And for the last two years, I've watched the monarch butterfly, and the monarch caterpillar, I should say, up here, eat the leaves. And they're very methodical about it. They start on one leaf, eat it all, and then go to the next one. And as you know, they only eat the leaves of the monarch, I'm sorry, of the milkweed. Uh, so the, the milkweed is their own, their only, uh, larval host. But I think they're so pretty. They kind of look like Queen Anne's lace um, and they have a rhizome so they spread underneath um, and also by seed. So like the, the uh, butterfly milkweed, the common milkweed is also a larval host to the monarch. I think this one is more common. Uh, the leaves contain glycosides and they are toxic to birds and other predators. So it's kind of mother nature's way of protecting the pollinators. Uh, but the larvae uh, of the butterfly and also the adult butterflies can eat them and it's not toxic for them. 
And you can see that the color here is a purple and down here it's a pink. So you usually get um, one or other of those colors on your plant. And these are the pods down here, which we're all familiar with, that let those lovely little airplanes out to go and plant themselves. So this next one, I think we're all familiar with. You probably have these in your garden. Um, they're a black-eyed Susie. I call them the sunny-faced black-eyed Susies. And they attract bees, insects, and butterflies uh, who eat the nectar. And birds also eat the seeds. So in the fall, you get a cluster of seeds here in the middle and in the black part. And um, then they dry and, and mature and the birds just love them. So a couple more um, and then we're, we're on to the next part. So the high bush cranberry. The berries of the high bush cranberry make an excellent winter survival food for birds because they remain above the snow and the berries are sweeter after freezing. And they're a shrub, but they can grow up to uh, 12 feet. And lastly, the fragrant sumac. And I have one of these that has been growing for about three years now. And I learned quite a bit about it because I get <clears throat> here, I'm getting the uh, cat-like flowers that are yellow in the spring. Um, but I am not getting any ripened berries. And I think I know why now, because um, I learned that uh, birds in the early spring find this, um, like the high bush cranberry, as a, a great source of food. It's one of the first sources of food that they can find. And so they eat them. And uh, then um, if they're not eaten, they then turn into berries, red berries for the fall. And again, the berries are sweeter because they've been frozen. Um, so now I know why I've never seen red berries on my fragrant sumac. So now I'm gonna show you some uh, suppliers. And I've chosen these uh, because they're all within a one hour drive from Halton. So we like to, to choose local vendors and support the local nurseries. Uh, the first one is called Bee Sweet Nature Company, and it is in, trying to think where it is, um, it's in Puss, Puss Lynch. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Am I saying that right? <laughs> um, and Kayanese, um, I know Andrea uses, and they're in Caledonia. Uh, Native Plant Source, which is in Breslau. Origin Native Plants, it's in Guelph. Ontario Native Plants is in uh, Freelton or very close to Freelton. And then I'm giving a plug uh, since I was on the board of the North American Native Plant Society, um, and I'm still a member to uh, the fundraising sale that we have every year. Uh, it's been in Toronto for over 15 years and we did a pilot in Hamilton last fall that worked really well. So we're going back to Hamilton. And for the very first time, we're having one in Brantford. Um, and that will be posted on the NAPS website. Uh, at the end of March. And um, Hamilton's uh, pickup will be May 14th and Brantford, May 28th. So they're advanced sales that you can order online. There, that's my, that's my advert. <laughs> okay, uh, this is the Lorraine Johnson book I talked about earlier. So 100 Easy to Grow Native Plants. Um, she it goes through meadow plants, wetland plants, prairie plants, woodland plants. Uh, she shows you what comes in the spring, uh, summer, fall. And so it's just a great guide to go and, and uh, dive into and decide uh, how you're going to design your garden or what type of plants you're going to incorporate into your existing garden. And then the next uh, brochure Andrea told me about, I didn't know about it. Um, it's part of a program called Grow Me Instead. And it is a guide prepared by the Ontario Invasive Plant Council that really takes you through, uh, instead of Ephragmites, you might want to grow this one. And so it's an excellent guide to show you what you can plant that won't be invasive. This was the uh, 
Douglas Tallamy webinar that I was talking to you about earlier. Uh, it came out this uh, fall and it was done in conjunction with David Suzuki uh, Foundation. Um, and you can watch it right here, it's just excellent. And that's where I got the information about the fact that 5% of native plants account for 75% of, of the food that caterpillars eat. Um, it's called the Homegrown National Park. And the concept is that we can all have a little bit of park space in our private property. And these are really great uh, webinars as well. Uh, Kevin Cavanaugh, uh, who's from St. Williams area on Lake Erie uh, and has a nursery there. He talked about birds um, uh, last fall. It was fantastic. So birds and native plants. And Dr. Lawrence Packer, who's from, uh, Guel sorry, from York University, is a bee expert, knows everything you'd ever want to know about bees. And the same goes for Jessica Linton, um, who is an expert on butterflies. So those are all fun resources if you want to tune into some webinars and forget about snow. So this is my last slide. Um, and this is quite an interesting website. So this was one that Doug Tallamy talked about in his webinar. And if you go to this link, you will find there are 10 different regions in the US and Canada, and your area is in one of those regions. And then you can click the link and find out what are the best trees or plants to grow according to what you want. So this is a list of trees and plants that caterpillars and birds love. And birds love caterpillars, as we know. Um, and I'm not gonna take you through it, but I, I wanted to let you know about this reference. We are considered the Eastern temperate zone. And you can also, if you want bees, there's a list of uh, trees and plants that are most important if you want bees. Um, so it's, it's a really good resource and I didn't even know it existed before I watched uh, the webinar. And I'd like to thank TD, Friends of the Environment Foundation, for funding this webinar uh, as part of the HEN 2022 Gardening Series. Thank you, TD, you've been very generous. So that concludes our talk. And uh, now I'd like to turn it over to any questions that you might have. And I'm gonna go into the chat box here. Andrea, do you want to um, start off since I haven't had a chance at the chat yet? Sure, I managed to switch computers. So I'm hoping that my audio is better now. It is good. It's just a, it's a hundred percent. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, and yes, I really appreciate you giving the overview on uh, those 15 particular plants that we highlighted and uh, that we plan on using in the site restoration. I did see some questions about how far north some of these plants are uh, able to be grown. I don't have that answer off the top of my head. I know some of them when we do the research, I typically see zones two to six. I'm not sure how far north Northwest Territories is considered, um, but definitely check with your local nurseries as well. They'll be able to, to tell you the suitability for growing some of these. And it's pretty easy to do a, a Google search to see um, the growing zones for some of the plants that Donna's highlighted. But definitely, um, we do trade our plants. Um, I always like freebies. And we have highlighted some of the local nurseries that we use. Guyanase in particular is located on Six Nations land. So I like to get my native species from an indigenous grower to support the work that they're doing and to feel comfortable in uh, the knowledge that what I'm planting has been sourced sustainably, grown sustainably, and that it's it's not a hybrid necessarily. Um, I want to um, use native species as much as I can in the work that I do. So that's why we've highlighted some of these local growers. But I did see um, a comment in there about trading plants and I'm all up for a plant swap um, any day of the week. We will be sharing um, the slides on our website and a recording of this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel as well. Um, See lots of comments and thank you, Kathy, for uh, being our online 
Q and A answerer, um, and for answering some of these questions about the plants that we're seeing in here. Does anybody have any other questions for Donna about uh, the material that she's presented? So we have a Lorraine Johnson here. <laughs> it seems to be the Lorraine Johnson. Is it Lorraine? <laughs> it is. Awesome. <laughs> I so gave you a good shout out there, Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> we like. Uh... I like to call Lorraine Mrs. Native Plant of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine, you'd be glad to know I've, I've called you that several times now. <laughs> it's good to have local experts to call upon. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, we'll, we'll forward them to Lorraine. <laughs> All right, please do. Um, uh, let me see. As a disabled senior. Oh, here we go. Do not plant honor spread. That you're mentioning my book. Thank you. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah I didn't know. It wasn't a, an intentional plug. <laughs> <laughs> Honest, Lorraine didn't pay me $100. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Susan's got uh, a question here. Um, as a disabled senior, the way the plant spreads may be a deal breaker to see if it goes in my garden or not. Right, so are any of these aggressive spreaders? The only one that I think in that list would be an enthusiastic spreader would be the black-eyed Susans. The others, uh, I have a lot of those in my personal garden at home. Um, the Joe Pie Weed, um, the Meadow Sweet. I would say none of the ones that we featured today are aggressive or even really enthusiastic, except for the Black Eyed Susan. Donna, what do you think? I agree completely. Yeah. And Black Eyed Susan, it's, you know, you can easily take it out and, and uh, give it away, put it on your curbside. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it is very plentiful. Not as much as some of them like Pearly Everlasting. Um, the Canada or, uh, anemone, if it gets anemone, too much fun. Yeah. Anemone, yeah. <laughs> anemone is everywhere in my garden. I planted two plants and um, it's everywhere. <laughs> the more sunshine that one gets, the happier it is to spread. So I, I keep it in the shade and it seems to be under control. So there's a question here. Oh yes, I forgot about the milkweeds. Yes, common milkweed. Yes, aggressive spreader. Oh yes, of course. I, oh, I forgot yeah, about that worst. one. <laughs> I've got a, a friend who's 89 and she's got a native plant garden and she keeps saying, I keep taking them out of every place in my garden. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, Pop all of those seed heads off before they uh, start to spread and that will help considerably. Um, we do have a question here or comment slash question. I want to sow some native seeds, have some seeds from swaps. Should I try and buy seed from St. William's Nursery instead due to the source being more certain and local? I, I would, would buy think, local. Yeah. Um, I would, I would buy local um, and make sure that you get a nursery that is growing their own seed because mm -hmm. some, some nurseries do not grow their own seed. Uh, some uh, bring in seed from Europe. And, yep. uh, and NAMPS, uh, the North American Native Plant Society, is extremely particular. We vet all the nurseries, and we deal with about seven or eight of them for our plant sales uh, in Ontario. Uh, we vet them all and make sure that they can produce uh, paperwork to show that they are not getting seed from other places. Uh, there are lots of places where you can get seed. Um, there are seed exchange. David Suzuki Foundation is involved in them. So is the Carolinian Canada um, org. And, uh, and NAMPS also has something called Seedex where you can buy seeds for 25 cents a pack. We try to encourage it because it's a very economical way of starting a native plant garden. Mm -hmm. I would say if you're doing a swap and you select seeds, the more information that they have on the label, which is good practice, um, the more comfortable you can be with the seed itself. So if they 
if they say where it was sourced from and when it was sourced, and if they did the sourcing themselves, so if they, they saved the seed from their backyard garden and they're located in Oakville and they sourced it in 2021, then you feel fairly certain that it's local, it's recent and viable, um, and you know, uh, the more information you know about the seed source, the better. So it's not that you shouldn't use them, just be careful that, just be careful. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine, for telling me about the fragrant sumac. I didn't realize that there was male and female, so I must have um, a male because I don't have berries. So maybe it's not that the, the deer are eating them <laughs> before I get to them. Mm -hmm. um, further to the comment about not being able to find seed for sale at Guyana say, no, they, they may have wildflower seed packet mixtures for uh, on offer at their front desk, but they do not sell seed online. They um, only source enough seed locally to supply their own greenhouse needs. Scrolling down through all of the milkweed comments. Um, you mentioned sneezeweed as being poisonous to human. How much does it spread? Can it still be gardened? How much do you know about sneezeweed to answer those particular questions? Not, not a lot. Um, In Donna's defense, I gave her the list of plants that we were using at the meeting house location. So um, that one, Kathy and Lorraine, if you happen to know, otherwise we will do a, a quick Google search and uh, see what we can find. I also found that somebody, I think it was Catherine who, who said that she had a, a butterfly milkweed in a uh, small uh, indoor container in a 20 inch round container. Yeah, I, uh, I have plants that I take outside and then bring inside in their pots. And I've got a butterfly milkweed and a blue verbane that come back every year and they're just dormant. Uh, I trim them back and then they come back and I take them back outside in the spring. We have a fantastic question about sowing native seeds this year in mid-March in a field. Well, we happen to have an upcoming presentation on winter sowing. Um, so what you can do to cold stratify and um, germinate seeds that need that process. Um, it's not specifically dealing with doing it in a field, but showing you how to get some seeds started. If you want to, um, sow directly into a field, uh, I would say make sure that you're not doing any damage to the soil structure by walking on anything that's super saturated. So I would need to know a little bit more about the field itself, but generally um, sow and grow. And there's um, an excellent webinar that NAMPS just had and you can find, it will be posted if it's not already, I think it is, but it will be posted shortly if it's not under events. It was Melissa Spearing on February 16th who gave a webinar on how to grow native plants from seed. Mm -hmm. um, she, she knows so much about native plants. She's a senior uh, biologist with uh, Natural Resources Canada. So I would encourage you to have a look at that. And on uh, April 14th, Paul Hayden, who is um, the owner of Grow Wild and also a native plant expert is going to be giving a talk on how to collect seeds. And that's one that I um, want to attend as well because I recently, for the first time, donated plants to Seedex. But for the last five years, I've been too, too frightened to, wasn't quite sure how to do it. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping to be able to learn some best practices around how to collect seed. On that note, can you share some more information about Seedex? We've had a question uh, come in about wanting to know more. What is it, how does it work? Sure, so CDEX works this way. Um, members, and I, I donated, as I said, this year. Um, uh, they give the plants to the plant sale committee and then uh, they package it. They clean, clean the seed and package it into little paper um, packages, put the date and put the, the species, uh, as Andrea said, put the location. So when I, 
uh, sent my seeds in, I had to say the area and my name and the date. And so you know where they come from and you know whether they're going to be okay for your region. Um, you simply look on uh, the NAMPS website. I'll, I'll get it up for you. Uh, CDEX, and then um, they will send you the plants that you ask for. And they're very inexpensive, as I noted. You'll pay a small amount for postage, but basically we do not make any money on it. We do it so that people will plant native plants because that's our mission. So I'll grab you the, uh, the website. Okay, and while you're doing that, um, there's a question here about when you discuss local source is what distance does that refer? Uh, I would say it's less about distance and more about um, similar growing conditions and, and zones. Um, something growing in Sarnia is not local to the GTA, in my humble opinion. Um, even when we're doing projects with Credit Valley, they are very particular about sourcing and making sure that the plants are appropriate for the project site. So understanding your soil conditions, your um, last frost dates, all of these are going to play into consideration around what local means to your project. So I would say it's less about distance and more around um, uh, the habitat and the ecosystem that surrounds you. So there's a question about whether it's too late to stratify seeds and uh, to sow this year. Um, depends on when you want to sow them. I guess that's the question. I would, you know, I would leave them in cold for about two to three months. That's what I do with mine. I had all mine in the fridge and then took them out to donate them to Cedex. So, um, you know, you can plant in, in July or August. So in that case, you've got enough time. But if you want something to flower, um, you know, early summer, I'd say it's too late. I still have a couple of trays that I'm hoping to get done. So give me some encouragement, Donna. Okay, well, you can, uh, as I say, you can get plants in, in the fall if you want. Uh, you can sow in the fall and then you'll have plants next year. So. Um, I tell native plants, people that are planting gardens, you know, it's not probably going to be real pretty the first year, or maybe not so pretty the second year, but the third year, it'll be just awesome. And you'll never have to do any, uh, you know, heavy duty uh, weeding or maintenance. So, you know, watering. So um, I, think, I think you can be happy about the fact that the plant was planted in the fall and, and that it's going to come up the next spring. Mm -hmm. um, so I've posted the, uh, the CDEX link there for people to have a look at. If they were outside in packets, is that good enough to stratify the seeds? I'm being told yes. Uh, I have a friend that, that does that. Um, and again, uh, Lorraine, if you're on, you're welcome to, uh, to add uh, to, it, to that. But my friend Harold Smith, who Lorraine knows, um, keeps his seeds outside. Now they're in a sheltered area, uh, but they are outside. Hi, it's Lorraine here. Um, is it okay hi, if I? Hi. Yeah, hi. and Kathy, if you if you have um, thoughts too, please chime in as well. Um, I know lots of folks who are um, just starting to stratify right now. Um, you know, uh, if you're worried, you could keep them in the fridge for six weeks. You know, to ensure. Um, to ensure um, that that cold period, because outside the weather is getting a bit, uns, you know, um, uh, changeable. So yeah, but now it's certainly, it, there's, it's certainly long enough. Um, the question is, if they're outside in packets, I'd suggest to be, uh, um, to be absolutely certain, just leave them in the fridge for six weeks, if that's an option for you. Um, that's just a, a general answer. And Kathy, if you've got something else, Please so that's good, in. Lorraine. So you're saying six weeks is enough. What, what I've been told is two to three months. So that's a lot longer. I like the idea. I don't have to, to uh, yeah. monopolize my fridge for, for three months. <laughs> you know what? It's also, I mean, these are very general broad strokes answers as well. And there's so much specificity for, for each plant. I know there are ways you can accelerate the stratification um, 
and it's on the Wildflower Farm website. Um, and it has to do with alternating between the freezer and the fridge. And um, it really accelerates, um, accelerates the stratification. So details on, I, I, Dawn, it looks like you're looking it up. I think it's Wildflower Farm dot, and I'm not sure if it's dot CA or dot, um, yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And then there are issues around some plants need cold, moist stratification. Some are fine with just cold. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of specificity. So it's not too late to start, but um, it's a good idea to maybe look into each particular species and its needs. I Thanks agree. Thank you so much. Um, wildflower Farms, uh, I have purchased a lot of seeds uh, from them and they per plant they will tell you um, the, the winter sowing strategy for that particular uh, variety so um, the grasses that I, I'm hoping to use for the meeting house um, and some of the other wildflowers they were chosen specifically because we can plant them in the fall after we get the phragmites uh, removed and then hopefully by the next spring, a lot of that legwork will be done for us. And then we will continue to plant in larger size um, plants as well. But a lot of the work that we can just spread the seed and um, plant very inexpensively, that's what we're hoping to do. So there well, are- That's a great resource. I didn't know yeah. about them. So I, Lorraine, yeah. I put that uh, link in the chat box. Thank you. Kathy, do you have anything you'd like to, to add or comment on? I was just going to agree with Lorraine. It's, it's somewhat species dependent um, so that, you know, you, you have to look up each one individually to see what the optimal conditions are. But uh, yeah, what the advice you've been given is, is, is bang on, just, just great. So Kathy, can you tell us a, a bit about the links that you put up? There are a couple there that I haven't heard of. Oh, I, I, Tom Clothier, it's, it's just a general reference. He's basically for every species given um, conditions for germination. They, they aren't, there are alternatives. That, that is, you know, there, there are things that work because people keep experimenting. So some people, for instance, you, you discover stratification works and then if you alternate it, you might speed it up. So there's some fundamentals and then you can play with those to see whether or not you can you know, shorten the time. It depends on the kind of dormancy different seeds have. And some literally have, are time dependent. They simply need to, to rest for a given time. Others have things that need to break down the chemicals in the, the test of the shell. So it's, it's quite complex and I can't you know, take, take a whole hour to, to talk about the different uh, requirements. But yeah, there, there are several sites. Tom Clothier is, is a really good one. And then uh, you know, Wildflower Farms, she's done a really nice job with you know, each of her seeds to say what works. And we're, we're still learning. So, you know, we keep, keep track of what you do and we, we discover new things all the time. And the simplest way is just to plant them in your garden, let them grow on their own. See if they're happy. Yes, and Marika, um, Wildflower Farms is located just north of Barrie uh, towards Aurelia. So it's an excellent resource for finding out specific um, stratification needs for Southern Ontario. Excellent. That's great. I didn't know about it. And then, Catherine, there's another website link that you put up here, plants.ces.ncsu.edu. It must be an educational website. Hmm. I'm sorry, I don't see that one to recopy. Uh, at 2.41 p.m., um, there's a link. Okay, that helps. 241. Way back. Well, I'll look it up and I'll be able to see what it is. Keystone plants by eco region. Okay, let me just copy it to the bottom of the chat for people. Oh, now, no, I think that, that was, was a different one. Sorry, that was one of Kathy. That was the one that I had on my. Uh, yep. 
so many great resources. We will try and copy and consolidate. I'll, I'll tell you what this one is because I'm just getting it up. It is the North Carolina Plant Toolbox is what the heading says, the North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant okay. Toolbox. So extensions are great. Um, they give a lot of information. Try and use something from South Carolina as a general one, um, and then try and find a second source closer to home just to validate and verify and maybe hone in that information a little bit. Um, local resources, Donna is, can become your new best friend, the North American Native Plant Society, um, your local hort societies. Um, you know, this is why we get together and share information and resources so that we can help answer some of these questions and make sure you're choosing appropriate plants um, for, the local, um, for the local area. There's yeah, that one local thing. again, and I know we're coming from all over the place, so. Um, we'll try to get something to support your, your local nurseries wherever you are, I think is, is the idea. I think we're all on board. Um, yeah. Also, you, you most likely know this, but um, there is a real shortage of seeds out there uh, and thus plants as well. And so this year when I ordered plants for the, the Brantford and Hamilton plant sales, I put my order in in November. Um, and we for Toronto put our order in in January and usually we put it in in March. So um, if you want to uh, get native seeds or native plants, I would encourage you to um, go early. And last year, I know Ontario uh, native plants um, and several other nurseries were up and running March 1st. I got an email from Origin native plants in Guelph, one of the ones I had up on, on the slide, and they already are selling them. Um, so, you know, it, there is a scarcity out there and, and there is a uh, Ontario Native Plant Growers Association and NAMP sits on the committee where they're, they've got, you know, they're developing a long-term seed strategy because we want to rectify that. Um, but just so you know, because during COVID gardening took off um, and we all know that, um, but also native plants because the, the uh, climate change uh, environment are taking off and have taken off in the last five years. So order sooner rather than later. So um, I'm thinking if uh, there aren't any more questions, please feel free to email me. I'll put my I am going to do the same. Here. I'm going to put our uh, general information number into the chat box if anybody wants to uh, send follow up questions specifically around uh, sourcing plants or additional questions about this presentation, please do send either one of us a message. Um, specifically around the pussy willow shrubs, I am hoping to order a number of those for our upcoming plant sale, hoping that we will have those uh, the plant sale organized for Southern Halton region, hopefully Northern Halton region as well for May, just after the long weekend. So do stay in touch with us and we will continue to answer questions, make plants available as widely as we can. And, um, and Linda, I wanted to ask you, where do you live? Maybe, uh, maybe Andrea knows. Maybe that will help. No, I'm not familiar with Linda, I'm sorry. <laughs> Linda, are you local? Are you within Halton? <laughs> we will stay in touch. Yeah. So uh, we will wrap up this presentation shortly. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Donna, for leading the discussion today and for providing the information that you did. Please join us for the rest of our Halton Garden Week speaker series. We have additional uh, talks happening today. I can't remember if there's one at four o'clock. There's definitely one at 7 p.m. tonight um, about uh edibles in helen help me out here edible species yes, in the native plant. <laughs> yes it's Not edible uh, <laughs> edible perennials in our landscape and it's going to be at you. 7 tonight. Yeah. thank you and then we've got a full lineup for tomorrow 
which is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy and Lorraine, for weighing in. <laughs> Enjoyed your help. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks.